Hi, everybody. Thanks, Ben. And um, it's lovely to be here. Um, I was asked to try and provide some sort of opening framing, I guess, of the topic. Can you hear me or not? I can hardly hear myself um, on Sacred Australia. One thing I was going to mention was that the, there's already been, a, already been a book on this. Uh, interestingly enough, it's uh, written by an Indian man, Makaran Paranjapi from New Delhi, who often visits Australia. Sacred Australia, I've got a chapter in there myself. And uh, he says in the start of that book that when it comes to Australia, the terrain of the sacred is ambiguous and difficult. The Australian sacred remains internally fragmented, disturbingly contradicted, and painfully wounded. And he says this impacts the psyche of the nation and calls for urgent attention and healing. So that's, uh, that's his particular book. Um, I've just returned from a lecture tour of the United Kingdom, and I've been, as somebody from, as Ben said, from the Northern Territory, I've been speaking on this topic of Didiri, which is uh, deep listening. Um, I did some work, I've done some work over recent years with Miriam Rose Ongema, up from the Daly River, up near, near Darwin, and um, she calls her work the Aboriginal gift of contemplation. I sent that talk to you, Jim, I think, a little while ago. And um, I gave that talk at Westminster Cathedral just a couple of weeks ago in London. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, another bit of show and tell, Edge of the Sacred, is one of the books that I've written. I called it Edge because I've always felt that Australia is just on the edge of understanding what sacred even is. Just on the edge of it. And, and ironically, I wrote that from the centre not from the edge, I wrote that uh, from Alice Green. And another book that Ben mentioned, I've written on this topic, is Reenchantment, the new, the new Australian Spirituality. So I've been thinking about this whole topic for a long time. Um, someone asked me, was, is my background Christian? Well, yeah, but also uh, I grew up with and alongside Aboriginal people and they actually had almost more impact on me than the Christianity did. So, you know, I was sort of living between these two worlds, Aboriginal dreaming and uh, understanding it, very much as an outsider. And I don't for one minute presume to be able to speak with much authority on Aboriginal spirituality because I remain an outsider to it. I often speak on this topic of sacred Australia and people say, isn't that an oxymoron? You know, isn't that a contradiction in terms? That um, because Australia officially means what is secular and modern and enlightened and the sacred evokes the mists of the past that modern Australia feels that it has outgrown or somehow gone beyond. And I think official Australia does its best to hide from the sense of the sacred, which is why we haven't really, as a culture, you know, we've got, what, 40, 50,000 years of Aboriginal culture here, which uh, we're honouring here today. Um, but also, the European Australia, which is uh, 200 years old, it hasn't really done much, I don't think, to think about Aboriginal spirituality. Why? Um, because I think it's too raw for it. Um, Christianity came here in a very um, a position of great uh, imperialism and it was linked to colonialism, colonization. And um, in Central Australia, where I grew up, the Christian churches thought that they were the, the one true faith and all the other faiths were wrong or inferior. Now that's changed, luckily. And so there's a lot more openness going on in Outback Australia and in the cities of Australia about the plurality of the sacred, the fact that it is diverse. It's not just one way, there are many ways. In fact, Miriam Rose, uh, the Didiri lady, she describes herself as two-way, as being both Catholic and Aboriginal dreaming. Two-way, interesting term. It's used a lot in the Northern Territory, but I don't think it's used a great deal in cities like the one we're in. 
We, uh, official Australia, as I said, is secular, very secular. Helen Garner once said to Michael Looney, I've always thought that embarrassment is a key thing in the Australian psyche. It's very profound. And Michael Looney replied, he should be here too, Ben. In a moment of embarrassment, there's a truth present. The embarrassing moments are when control is imperfect when other people see that there's some big force. I really like that. Um, That, you know, both Helen Garner and Michael Lunick, very important Melbourne artists, um, have both made their journey away from the secular mainstream of the literary culture in which they existed and have found their way into a more spiritual position, often at great opposition, actually, and uh, both of them are being derided and ridiculed by their colleagues who are more part of secular Australia. So I suppose one of the points I want to make in opening is that sacred Australia is a countercultural discourse and it upsets people, it gets up people's nose. As soon as you talk about sacred Australia, people are up in arms, they're feeling uneasy. You know, they thought, I, I thought God was dead, said my neighbour the other day. When I did a, a t- I did a radio show with a, a colleague of Jim's, Thomas Keneally, the Australian novelist, on Good Friday, and I was talking about religion in Australia, and my neighbours next door heard it, and they said, "Haven't you heard God's dead?" I said, "Yes, I, I have definitely heard that, but I don't believe it." You know? So um, we do live in a very godless society, a very very secular society that doesn't even know the first thing about how to get a handle on this thing called Sacred Australia. But the arts in Australia have done an enormous amount to contribute to this. If you look at music, painting, poetry, fiction, you know, we've got people like Peter Skullthorpe in music, Ross Edwards, we've got um, Michael Lunig in cartooning, Tim Winton in fiction, Judith Wright and Gwen Harwood, Les Murray, all these people are talking about the sacred in Australia all the time. But people aren't really listening to them, especially the academics who teach them, which is why Les Murray once tried to withdraw his books from university courses. He said, you're murdering my books. He said, unless you're communicating a sense of the sacred, you're not actually doing justice to my word. Now, When we think about the sources of the sacred, we obviously think not only about the arts in Australia, but also about, as I said, Aboriginal Australia. And I want to make a a very um, um, concerned point about this. Naturally, one of the places to turn for the sacred in Australia is Aboriginal Australia. If white Australia thinks nothing is sacred, Black Australia believes that potentially, at least, everything is sacred. These are mirror images of each other. So it's a quite a schizophrenic culture we live in. I think there's a lot of pain, as Macaran Parantipi said, the sacred in Australia is quite wounded, quite fragmented. I think that this is a very interesting moment, especially with regard to Jim Bowler's work and John Mulvaney and all the work around Mungo Man and Mungo and Lady Mungo we'll hear about later, not to racialize the sacred too much and confine it to only one stream of the community. It might be easier that way for the mainstream white fellow Australians to split off their sacredness and project it onto the Aboriginal culture as the first Australians, but also as the minority group in Australia. I think it's dangerous to do this. If Aboriginal people become fused with the sacred, which I think they largely have in the Australian imagination, and if the sacred does not matter to secular Australians, which is the vast majority, then Aboriginal people don't matter either. So they become sacrificed to the sacred, while the mainstream society can go ahead with its purely profane and secular kind of existence. So I think we've got to be very careful about splitting off and racialising the sacred. The sacred belongs to all people. That's what Aboriginal people, where I grew up, kept saying. 
What's your dreaming? They kept saying to me when I was a kid. What do you believe in? What's sacred to you? It's always self-implicating. I think we've got to understand that. That if we talk about sacred Australia, it's self-implicating. It's not just something we can say it's out there and other people have it. We have to take, everybody has to take a relationship on it. So, um, if Aboriginal people are only sacred, then we're in danger of saying that they're just confined to yet another white fella stereotype, which precludes any real concern for them as political citizens and for their educational, social, mental and health needs and well-being. Now, there's long been a pernicious belief in secular Australia, fostered by a crude form of Darwinism, that Aboriginals are a doomed people, destined to die out. That's what I was told when I was a kid. And there's nothing that can be done to help them except smooth the pillow of a dying race, according to Daisy Bates in her book, The Passing of the Aborigine, which is a book I had to read in high school in Alice Springs. Did you read it, Father Bob? The Passing... Hey? Banned? <laughs> oh, the Catholics banned it, did they? Jeez, they ban everything that's good. Yeah. Anyway, as we know, and as we hope, that this idea of the passing of the Aboriginal people is complete nonsense, a white genocidal fantasy. But in a sense, it tragically adds to the genocidal fantasy if Western imperialism confines Aboriginal people now to the sacred domain, which does not matter to a primor primor primarily secular culture. We kill them off by our lethal projections of the sacred and our innate inability to deal with the spiritual in our own lives, which is, I think it's self-implicating. The poet Les Murray was one of the first of the Australian artists to be able to see this. He said, the sacred has become a fairy tale reserve for those rich only in that and 50,000 years here. Very interesting. Les Murray, the New South Wales poet, the first to spot this. I recently gave a talk at a conference in New Zealand and I can see the same thing happening there. The white fellows in New Zealand, on the whole, are very, very secular, very secular, atheistic bunch. And the Maori people, of course, are profoundly spiritual. And so one of the things I said at that conference, which pissed everybody off, it was almost, I almost had to escape through the back door, was that you're never going to advance the cause of spirituality in New Zealand unless the white people understand that they've got to understand this from their point of view. That's embarrassing, as Michael Looney said. We don't want to deal with that. We don't want to deal with our Christianity because we feel we've grown out and thrown it away. We don't want to deal with our Judaism or our Islam or whatever it is because we feel we've become adjusted to the secular. But in order to have a sacred Australia, all those traditions have to come to the table. All have to share. And then Aboriginal spirituality can take its place which I think is a very, very primary place as the uh, first people of this land, the first peoples of, of Australia. When the um, anthropologist uh, Bill Stanner, did you know Bill, Jim? Yeah. Uh, went up to Daly River where uh, Mar uh, Miriam Rose lives with her Didiri work and did some research on Aboriginal culture. Come in. He met an Aboriginal elder in Daly River, the Daly River Ports Keats area in the top end, who said to him this, white man got no dreaming, him go another way, white man him go different, him got road belong himself. And Bill Stanner wrote a book called White Man Got No Dreaming back in the 50s and 60s. And my colleague at La Trobe University, Robert Mann, He's very interested in this. And he wrote a book recently called The Dreaming and Other Essays because that original book from Bill Stanner was completely out of print. 
Now, the last, I've, I've only been given 10 minutes. I've, I've been trained to give two hour lectures at the university. <laughs> So how do I shrink that to 10 minutes? I've probably got two more left. So let me just say a couple of things. One is that I feel that spirituality is not just a head trip. It's about our whole lives. It's about our well-being. It's about our health, especially our mental health. If you take spirituality away from Aboriginal people, you know, it, you see what happens, it, it can be devastating. I mean, the suicide rate in Aboriginal culture, as you know, is about 15, 20 times higher than it is in white Australian culture. Uh, the mental health disorders that have gone on with the collapse of the dreaming and the tribal way of life is incredible. And one of the reasons I think why white Australians don't want to look at this is that we're just burdened by too much guilt. We are, and, and I'm the same, you know, I, we are burdened with a huge amount of white guilt. It's run down the, it's run down the generations. When I go to places around Victoria and other parts of Australia where there were massacres of Aboriginal people, I get two reactions. One is to deny that it happened, like Keith Windshuttle, <laughs> the Australian historian. The other is I just start crying emotionally, my feelings just start flowing. The idea how on earth we're ever going to get a discourse going on Australian spirituality unless we face the darkness of our past. As the bumper sticker used to say years ago, white Australia has a black history. It's totally true. And Paul Keating was on song with that. And when I came out with my book, Edge of the Sacred, he really liked it and he said it for the people um, of his cabinet to read. And, um, you know, those were the heady days where we were looking at Marbo and, um, and uh, Frank Brennan was involved from the Catholic side with uh, uh, Aboriginal justice issues. These were really heady days. And then along came John Howard and said, that's the black armband view of history. We don't want that. You know, we want to celebrate the pioneers and the settlement of Australia. And ever since, really, the end of the era of Paul Keating, we've been very uneasy about the issue of Australian spirituality because you can't have spirituality without feeling. You have to feel something. And the first set of feelings have to be sorrow and remorse and suffering for the uh, massacres. And not just the massacres, more Aboriginal people died from introduced diseases from Europe than they did from actually gunfire. You know, the tens of thousands of Aboriginal people died from introduced diseases, uh, even common cold, tuberculosis, hepatitis, all these sorts of things wiped out huge numbers of people. So we have to feel it's a wound. And I think the reason why a lot of people are really touchy is that they don't want the wound to be opened. When you see people on television, they've just had a bad experience, they always come on to TV and say, I want closure. You know, well, I don't think we should have closure. We should have openness to our suffering. We don't want closure. Every bogan and his dog wants closure now so that they can get back to life as normal. So we've got to resist that in Australia. We've got to open up to the, the feeling dimension, the intuitive dimension, and out of that, I think, will come some real healing. But unless there's emotion involved, there won't be healing at all. Which is why I think the universities are not involved in any way promoting this discourse about sacred Australia. One of my students said recently, all the interesting things now happen off campus, like in the House of Pan. You know, all the interesting things. When I was a kid, in the 1960s and 70s, all the interesting things happened on campus. But now they happen off campus. The universities are terrified of these subjects. Spirituality, no thanks. You know, sacred Australia, no thanks. We don't want any of that. We just want business as usual. So we've got to allow ourselves to be disrupted, to be moved, to understand history, to forget about the black armband view of history, and to actually accept the fact that there's a lot there to be uh, to, to suffer and to be sad about, and 
not wallow in that, but hopefully that we can all move on in some way together. My last point is that sacred Australia is not a thing. Okay? It's a way of looking at all things. So we can't fetishize sacred Australia and say, there it is. I was in Uluru recently and the, and the tourists beside me were saying, that's sacred Australia. And I said, well, that is sacred and it is Australia, but it's not sacred Australia. Sacred Australia is right here at Middle Brighton Station, believe it or not. You know, the sacred is everywhere except that we can't see it. Some of us can see it. Filmmakers, poets, artists, a lot of Aboriginal people can see the sacred no matter where they are. And that's the kind of thing that we have to try and develop. Thank you very much. I just uh, appreciate it.